and uh, this initiative is going really well. There's 52 registrants who are going to join us through the live streaming, and there's about 50 of us here, so wonderful initiative. Just be aware that the background noise is going to be picked out, so for uh, keeping that in mind, thank you very much. Uh, we'll try to keep our talks to the minimal. So thank you for coming, and thank you. Uh, a big thank you goes to, of course, Grant Thornton for actually hosting it today. We've got Mark Griffith, Jared Lee from Grant Thornton uh, hosting this, so thank you very much. We've got Alex Bell of Grant Thornton as well, who's going to talk about uh, uh, how do you know that you're not being deceived. So that's a wonderful topic, and that's why we are all here. Before we can go to Alex Bell's uh, interesting uh, presentation, actually I have a few pr uh, presentation or rather announcements to make, so I'll start with those. So first of all, we've got a proud moment today. We've got a certified internal auditor, a new one joining our family. So as you know, CIA or certified internal auditors is a globally accepted designation for internal auditors. And it's a standard um, by which individuals demonstrate that their professionalism is internal audit. So it goes to show not only what they've achieved, but it goes to show to the world that they're ready to take any challenges in the internal audit profession. So it is a big thing and it helps us um, to be more professional and it's a valued uh, accomplishment. So with that note, I'd like to congratulate today our new certified internal auditor, Jeffrey Moher. And Charlie, Charlie Kudikon will be uh, presenting this award. He's our chapter chair. Well done, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've also got some other chapter chairs present today, apart from Charlie, so if you want to just stand up, then you get to know who they are, and at the networking time, you can um, ask any questions. We've got Ken, we've got Chris, and Charlie, so you want to say a couple of words for Oh, us? yes. Th thanks very much, Chris. Um, just, just to introduce where we, we come from, really, uh, it's, it's a great privilege and an honor and a pleasure to have our members here both physically and online and I think this is the first meeting where we're seeing the live streaming actually being equal to our, or perhaps even more than those physically present in the room. Uh, so this is an initiative which the council uh, <coughs> started earlier um, in the uh, financial year and it's, it's taking off really well. But I just want to revisit a couple of points for the, the council and for the members here, both physically and online. We are all about our membership. So we, we do want to hear from you and we have that uh, feedback app, so please give us feedback at the end of this session. We're trying to engage with you on those hot topics you're interested in, like data analytics or cyber security. We want to see members, we want to see them at the meetings, we want to see them online and perhaps Hear your questions, please, online, if you can type them in at, at the end, and I'm sure Alex and, and Mark would, would be happy to answer them. And we want to keep in touch with our members through networking and through things like the International Conference, which Riz is going to talk to us about. I just want to reinforce on that point at the International Conference in July, uh, that that's a, a global event that's happening on our doorstep in Sydney, and there will also be an Audit and Risk Committee half-day uh, that kicks that session off. So please speak to your heads of audit, your audit committee members, uh, your chairs of audit committee, and encourage them to engage with that extra session that kicks off the international conference. A couple of points on membership. Uh, I wanted to remind you we now have a new website, which uh, Jonathan Flynn has very kindly organized. And I hope you've had a visit and had a quick look at that if you haven't. It's really improved uh, in terms of the, the look and feel, but please do visit the, the newly refreshed website. Also invite your colleagues to these meetings, so we're, we're very happy to welcome people uh, who are friends and colleagues to come along to a meeting and experience what we're doing here. And, and finally, a call out at this time of year, we're starting to look for our new nominations. So, 
There will be some green nominations within the council, but if any of you are interested in joining our council, we have a full council, so it's not too much hard work. Obviously, people like Liz and myself were concerned when we first joined about the, the commitment. We're all very busy, but between a number of us, we share the load, mm -hmm. and we have achieved a great deal this year, uh, and especially with the help of Ken and Chris and so on. Uh, I'd really encourage you to, to put your nominations forward, which should be published tomorrow. Uh, so you all should be receiving the, the, the process for, for doing that. But if you want to chat to any of the existing councillors, please do so later on today. And, and a final point, just on advocacy, please keep an eye out for a publication next month from the Australian Institute of Company Directors, which is the third edition, the refresh of um, audit committees and getting those to perform as best they can. We do engage behind the scenes with a number of bodies like the ASX Corporate Governance Council, the Australian Institute of Company Directors and so on. And if you, if you are interested in talking to us about that and our advocacy efforts and white papers and so on, uh, again, feel free to speak to any of us uh, from the council this evening. Thank I'll you. hand back to Riz. Thank, Thank you. Charlie. expand on what Charlie mentioned. This is a very exciting year for every Sydney sider because we get to be in Sydney, not buy an air ticket and be part of this international conference. So we are lucky this year. So we'll just go through a few slides to um, emphasize the importance of it. Uh, the theme is LIVE, which stands for Leadership, Innovation, Value and Effectiveness. It, it gives us access to 100 of internationally renowned speakers in our profession and there's going to be 70 sessions and 10 streams so there's a lot of opportunity for us to learn and we can uh, do it in a various different ways it's not one way so i'll let you go through their bios i don't want to talk about them but we have really good key speakers this year you probably know them already These are the streams. You can get more information on the website, obviously, so feel free to go and find out a bit more. Some highlights. So that gives you a structure of the pricing. And obviously it's a unique opportunity for us, as I mentioned. So lovely, thank you so much. Okay, so I've got three very quick announcements to make as well. Um, I am membership renewals. Uh, this time we are having a special. So if you haven't renewed already, if you renew by June 2017, you get a chance to be in a lucky draw and then you uh, get a chance to win an Apple iPhone 7. So, and if you actually uh, join online, then it's counted as two, two entries, then you double your chance. So something to be aware of. Uh, we are pleased to also inform that the IA Global is waiving the application fee for certified internal auditors, the CIA course. So as uh, Jeffrey Moher has got it, if you're inspired by him and you want to pursue it, if you join, uh, if you apply by May, you don't have to pay the US $115, $115. It will be waived. And the last announcement is Grad Cert IA, which is the Professional Graduate Certificate in Internal Auditing. Um, that uh, second stream will actually, uh, the closing date for that application is Monday, 12th of June. So if you have, uh, if you're keen yourself or somebody from your team wants to do it, it's a day to be. Uh, aware of. So that's about it. So I will now call upon uh, Mark Griffith. Thanks, Thank you Chris. very much for hosting and I'm
hoping that you're going to introduce the speaker for have, us. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along on, on the budget. I'm sure you're all anxious to get away and see what that means for you going forward. Um, very privileged to host the uh, event here this evening. Um, so please, I hope you enjoy the session that Alex is uh, going to do very shortly. Um, and please hang around for refreshments, etc. afterwards. Housekeeping, I know a lot of you are very familiar with our offices, I've been here a few times now, but we're certainly not expecting any fire alarms <laughs> or evacuations or anything this evening. That was all tested earlier today. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually, but I'm just sort of leading from Alex's presentation shortly, but in all seriousness, um, if there is a, an alarm of any type, then please head back out through the uh, doors plus reception and the stairwell is from the first doors on the left hand side. In terms of facilities, again, every needs the bathroom, then please head back out towards reception. Um, past the, the, the doors of reception, I'm actually first on your right and the, the bathrooms, etc. cetera, there. Um, phones, etc. I don't need to tell you guys about all those sorts of things. So, um, so Alex, very quickly, Alex, as uh, his slide suggests, is uh, actually a fellow partner, but uh, Alex sits in our forensic consulting practice uh, based here in, in Sydney. Um, now, this, um, Alex isn't an internal auditor, and um, I'm not sure whether we'll ever get to convert him at any point, but um, <laughs> he is somebody that actually, um, joking aside, actually engages with me and my team in terms of the uh, internal audit services that we deliver when that is required. Um, I think this is a really um, relevant topic in terms of what he's going to take us through. Um, we're not suggesting that you know, clients that we engage with are trying to deceive us at all, or the experience that you get in terms of the clients that you engage with, but um, I think uh, I'm sure there'll be some lessons that we can learn from the presentation that Alex is about to give. Um, that's probably all I want to say. Alex, right. thank you, Marty. Marty. And thanks a lot for um, having me along. It's great to see such a full room. It's um, probably the first time I've been live streamed. So, um, well, that's time I'll admit it anyway. Um, as, as Mark said, I'm a partner in the forensic team here. Um, people often ask, what on earth do you do? Uh, I've tried to explain it in our three little icons at the bottom. One is, is helping people with fraud prevention. The second one is investigation when an incident has occurred. And thirdly, as I am an accountant, any forensic accounting kind of analysis of data, analysis of accounts, trying to find money, um, that's what me and my team get involved in. Um, this uh, this slide is actually, I was trying to find the right photo for this slide, and it's quite interesting to find someone that's de deceptive. Um, I'm not sure whether the, the girl here is quite sure that she believes whatever is going on over here. Um, but the other deceptive aspect for um, the very observant of you is that this is probably a meeting. You can see this person's actually watching YouTube. Um, so I suspect they're not concentrating maybe on the meeting that they're supposed to. So what am I going to tell you about deception? Well, is there a silver bullet on deception that you can understand <coughs> immediately that someone's lying to you? Well, unfortunately, there's not. Um, but there's a lot of techniques and um, things that we can we can learn about um, how that are indicators of deception. And if we apply those, then maybe um, we can, that can help us with our investigations. Um, as an example, you know, we've all heard, ah, oh, if you look. If you have someone who's looking, you know, to the right or to the up, up to where it means they're recalling, or if they're looking to the left, it means they're, um, you know, lying. Uh, that's absolute rubbish. I can tell you that um, from research from the FBI reviewed 25 peer-reviewed studies that showed that there was absolutely no link between um, eye movement and deception. Where that's come from was actually um, from psychology, and there's an issue of. Um, there's an aspect of eye movement in relation to that, and it's kind of being misconstrued into deception. So if someone starts looking at you in a different different way, that isn't necessarily an indicator of deception. Um, you've got some techniques that claim to be scientific. There's a thing called scientific content analysis, um, which is where you 
as it says, you analyze the, the words that somebody's using. Um, again, this is, these are all tools that we can use to help us decide whether someone's deceiving or not, but they're not a sort of cast iron, yes, they've said this, therefore they're lying. You've just got to take the overall view with everything. So, I mean, really these techniques kind of crystallize what you might call your sixth sense. You often think that somebody may be lying to you, and these tools um, can just assist us in making that determination. So today, we're just going to talk about why this is important. I'm going to talk through some lie detection strategies, and I'm also going to give you a structure around doing an investigative interview. And I've actually got some handouts of that with me, and that will be provided as well online, um, so you can go away and, and next time you're having to do an investigation interview, um, that you can refer to this and, and it'll give you a few pointers. So why, why is this important? Well, here is my client, um, and we think he's a bit deceptive and maybe up to, up to no good. And the problem with this is if there's just me looking at it, there's only one pair of eyes on this person, and it's very easy for them to get away with what, um, whatever they're doing. And what we want to equip you for is to make sure that there are many pairs of eyes and, um, and therefore we can see, you know, if we're all looking at the issue, we can, we'll probably find out the person. And actually, I, I, had a, I had a thought about how I might, how I might demonstrate this, and Jared's been kind enough to sit in the front row. If, could, I just get, could I just get you out for a minute? And I'm just going to sit, sit on the chair here and, and just, look, just look that way. Now, don't be scared. So I've got I've got a tissue here, so I just really need to to sort of keep keep an eye on the tissue, okay? Yeah. Okay, can you look that way? Okay. So where did the tissue go? Behind me. Where do you where where do you think it's gone? You all saw it? You didn't see it. Okay? So if we're all looking at it and we're looking at things from a different angle, you could tell me precisely where that was. Poor Jared is like, not quite sure where it's gone. Thank you. Very good. So, let's talk about some detection strategies. The first one is around the change in behavior. So, it's really the change of language, change in, change in behavior that, that may indicate that somebody's lying. To do this, you have to establish a baseline of truth. And what we do in our interviews is try and start off with something that's quite simple. Um, that we know that's going to be true. And then when we get to the more pointy end of issues, you have to keep an eye out for those changes. And, um, and that change in language and that change in, in maybe body language is an indication that somebody's uncomfortable. Um, as an example of this, um, I actually saw someone being interviewed um, on, on camera at a, at a former, former firm of mine, and he was interviewing some partners about um, what they had done at the weekend, and the idea of the interview was that they would interview them about a truthful matter, and then he would get in to ask them about an imaginary fight, and the idea was that you had the truthful video playing there and the lying video there, and you could see the change in, um, in language and body language. But the most interesting thing of all of this was when he was asking the person about the truthful aspect of the weekend, the person said something like this. He said, Emma and I were married in 2005. On Saturday morning, we had breakfast. I then went for a walk with my wife. And the guy interviewing him was like, well, I'll actually ask you first, does there anything strike you about those statements. We didn't have breakfast we was all. We had breakfast. We had breakfast. And then I went to the wall with my wife. Well you said you said there's another there's three people involved. There's three people yeah it could be. Um and, and you said sort of Emma and I and then we and then what happened? I 
What, how do you refer to her at the end? It refers to and uh, by her name, we did this, I did something with my wife. And the interviewer was like, what happened on that walk? And the reason he said that was because he realized that he went, Emma and I, we did this, we did that, and then I did something with somebody else and with her. And the use of the word with suggested some kind of distance. And so he then was like, well, what happened? And the um, person was like, oh, oh, nothing, you know. No, no, something happened on that walk, and he started probing and probing and probing, and eventually got out of him that they'd had a massive row about the kids and the school. And the only reason he got that information out of the person who was telling the truth was because of the change in the language was from we to with. So that's my detection number one. Detection number two, not answering the question directly. I think probably we're all quite familiar with this, but I see it time and time again in interviews. You know, did you review this email? Oh, I would have done. Well, does that mean you reviewed the email or not? <coughs> it doesn't. Um, I, I had an interesting example of this uh, personally. So a few years ago, I worked at uh, a different firm, and my um, I, I was worked for a team. There were two partners in the team. I wasn't one of them. Um, those partners decided they wanted to move the whole team to a different firm, um, which was quite fun. It was about 12 of us. We hadn't been told anything about it, of course. They were, they were all above board. And I got a call on the Thursday night from one of my colleagues who's out on secondment at a client. And she says, I've just, I've just had a call from, I've just, someone's just walked into the room and said that John and Andrew, who were the two partners, are leaving and going to this other fire. I was like, what, what do you know about it? I was like, I don't know. Like, oh, I'll, when we get in in the morning, I'll, I'll ask them. So I get in the morning, get the two partners in their offices, and go, you know, just said, oh, I want to have a word with you. And go to, um, go to them, look, the rumor is that you're leaving and you're going to this other fire. And John, who was one of the forensic partners, also trained in interview techniques, responds, so I ask him, I hear you're moving and leaving. His response is not, no, that's not true. His response is, why are you asking that? And of course, as soon as he knew that, said that, I knew that it was true that they were leaving. He, because he was trained in investigative techniques, knew, also knew that I knew that they were leaving because <laughs> he knew that he hadn't given a direct answer to the question. And we did leave, and it was quite fun, and um, it was successful. Um, I wanted to include a second example, because I think it's really interesting, um, with uh, Donald Trump's nominee for the Environmental Protection Agency. This is back in January. So Corey Brooker asked, Booker asked him, you know, have you ever conducted business using your personal email accounts, non-official email accounts, text messages, instant messenger, voicemails, or any other medium. And look at his response. What strikes you about that, that response? It's evasive. Sorry? Evasive. It's evasive? Incomplete. Yeah, did he actually ask this question, answer the question? I mean, the thing that struck me immediately was he says, have you ever conducted business what is his response? I use, present tense. I use only my official accounts. Well, that's very nice. But what did he do for the last five years? And what do you think happened? Oh, a couple of weeks later, a few newspaper articles. Oh, he used all this private email. And like anyone who was trained in, in, in sort of deception could immediately have seen, like, actually before these came out, I saw an article about this and I was like, well, he obviously. He obviously used his own stuff. Um, the third, third of, uh, there's four detection strategies, by the way. Um, third one is not telling the whole story. So if someone tells you this, I counted the money, put the bag on the table, and left. 
what do you, do you, it may well be true, um, but where do you think the money is? Where's the money? In this pocket? No. Yeah, yeah, kind of the money, the bag's there, and I've gone. That's nice. He doesn't actually lie to you, but um, you know, haven't haven't told the whole truth. And um, I seem to be obsessed with U.S. politicians, but this this is a really interesting example. Back in the days when you had a president of the United States who you might expect to tell the truth um, at all times, this is Obama's statement about um, the, the uh, raid that killed Osama bin Laden. So he says, today at my direction, you know, we launched an operation. A small team of Americans <laughs> carried out the operation with extraordinary courage and capability, right? No Americans were harmed. They took care to avoid civilian casualties. After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden. Well, what strikes you about this? They may have killed a lot of other people as well. I mean, just because they took care, you yeah. don't know how many people were killed. Yeah, you took care to convert. That's very nice. You took care. Well, I'm sure they'd always take care. Well, how many people were killed? Um, the other thing, after a firefight, geez, where did this firefight come from? You know, apparently they just turned up. You know, didn't nobody got harmed? They killed him and and, and they left. So so many things, and actually, there's after this statement over the years, more and more information about this raid has has sort of come out, and it really didn't tell the whole truth. And I guess if you had been interviewed on it um, in a way that we might interview someone, then you would go back and try and fill in all those gaps. Um, an interesting example is um, apparently it was on Qantas's in-flight system quite recently. I don't know if it still is. There's a guy, Dan Airely who has done some very interesting research about people not telling the truth and the extent that they'll lie. And, and what he did was he got a series of, did a series of maths experiments um, with students at a university. And what he did was he got 20 people in a room, said, right, you've got five minutes to answer these 20 maths problems. So there was no way anyone could do them all. And on average, they got three to four right, and that's all anyone did. You did it, did it a number of times. So then he gets round two of the experiment, and he goes, well, do the test, and now at the end of the test, he just goes, right, I'd like you to rip up, destroy your answers, and please tell me how many you got right, or how many questions you did. How many, so they did three to four, and they did it a few times, how many do you think people said they got right? out of the 20 questions. 10? 15? But pretty much they all said 7. And the reason they did that was because most people, and I won't single out who said 15, um, <laughs> um, most people want to say, well, look, you know, I did 3 or 4, but I want to, you know, I'm a decent, decent person, I'm going to look myself in the mirror, <coughs> There's no way I could have done 15, so I'm not going to say 15. I'm just going to, you know, do a little bit more. So everyone said seven. And the really interesting thing about it is that he then did the experiment a number of times and started paying people money for every correct answer. And regardless of how much he paid them per answer, even if he was paying them like 50 bucks, 100 bucks per answer, everyone always said about seven because no one wanted to be completely completely outside the truth. And he did a number of other experiments on it. Um, it's well worth trying to find his, um, find his talk. Um, the fourth thing is micro versus macro expressions. Now, who can tell me who this person is? Sorry? No. He's a, he's a, this is actually Phil Lack, who is a professional poker player. Um, great guy, very interesting, very, very interesting. Phil is obviously an expert at reading micro expressions. And 
why I draw this distinction between macro and micro expressions? So, so macro expressions, you know, it means somebody, everyone's been past a meeting room where everyone's sat there and they've all got their arms behind the head because they're all sort of mirroring each other's body language. And sometimes you read things like, oh, you, you know, you've got their arms crossed and that means they're defensive. And the problem with that is that it's not necessarily true. And also you can, you know, if you've done um, rapport building um, exercises, you can actually lead someone in their body language. So if you're there saying, oh, this person's lying to me because they've got their arms crossed, actually they may have that because that's how you're sitting and, and you may have influenced them. Um, so it's very easy for that to be wrong. Whereas the micro expression is the one that's, you know, the, the point oh one, oh five of a second, the little flick, the little, you know, we've all seen people do it. They're the ones that are really, really hard to hide. Here he's trying to hide them by, by you know, he's got sunnies on and he's got, he's got his hood. Um, but they will spot <coughs> tiny, tiny little things. I was actually reading, I quite like poker, but so I was actually reading a thing today by, um, Daniel Negrani, who's one of the, well, famous players, and he was talking about how to, when you sit down at a table, how they, how we can find tells, and he said, oh, well, I might notice that if someone's chewing gum, they might stop chewing at a particular moment before they place a bet, and if I know that they did that when they were bluffing, then the next time I'll notice whether they stop chewing or not. Which is amazing, like that's why he's won $35 million in tournament earnings um, and countless more in, in cash games. Um, so they are the four sort of um, my four techniques. What I also wanted to cover was um, how to plan your interview. Now this, um, this structure I'm going to go through is a slightly modified version of um, what is called the peace model, which was developed um, a, by a lot of law enforcement people after years of interrogation type interviews and then finding them not to be very effective, um, particularly in the fact that you get coerced confessions um, and they adopted a different model to just um, interview in a, in a more open way. Um, what I've got is this slide actually forms a handout that I've got um, here that you can take away if you're online. It'll be harder to take away, but the, these slides will be available um, later. And the idea is that you know you can take one of these, and you can you know next time you're doing an investigative interview, you can you can um, might give you a few pointers. So the first part is preparation. Prepare to succeed in your interview. This is the single most important thing you would do. You need to go into that room. You know, knowing exactly what you want to get out of it because you've already done the investigation and you've got, you know, a lot of documents. You need to plan your questions. If I'm doing an interview, I'll sit down for quite a long time and work through exactly what questions I'm going to ask. You need to make sure you've got all your documents and organized. So, so my sort of investigations will often have uh, financial records, we'll have uh, emails, we'll have text messages, phones, um, you know, phone call logs, and, and you want to make sure that they are, you know, exactly where they are, because when it comes to that critical moment of, you know, you said you didn't call it, which actually happened to me about a month ago, you said you never called this person, I have this record of your, your text messages showing that you um, had various text messages and calls. Well, when you get to that moment, you don't want to be trying to find the, find the right document. You've got to know exactly where it is and you're there and you just, you know, present the information. Um, decide on your mode of recording. So you may wish to record sound <coughs> or video. Um, I, in, you know, obviously we're dealing with kind of broad situations. So I prefer to record um, my interviews. Obviously, to comply with legislation, you, you, you have agreement from the other person with that. And really, that's aimed at protecting them and you. Um, so there can't be any dispute about what was said, how it was said. Um, and it, it's funny, you, you, you think it's off-putting, and it kind of is for a little bit, uh, for the first minute or so. But, you know, I, I actually record with, my, with an app on my phone, and you just chuck it on there and you, and you, and you start recording. 
Well, actually, after a couple of minutes, you find people just forget, yeah. and and you know, it's just a phone on a desk, and no one really, you know, realizes. So, so the, but the the value you get from it is you have a transcript, and you know exactly what was said, and so you're not relying on your note taking. Obviously, if you're reviewing the accounts payable process, you might not wish to record <laughs> uh, the interview, but you know, in a particularly high stakes interviews, I would, I would want to have it recorded. Um, planning, it might sound stupid, but think about the logistics. Make sure that you've got the right venue, the right date and the time that they've got a meeting invite. Think about how the room's set up. So I would normally, if I'm doing an interview, try and avoid a situation where I'm directly opposite the person um, and sort of confronting them. Um, I would want to be slightly to the side. That also helps if you're, um, say you've got documents that you want them to look through, you can kind of be set, sat almost side by side, it feels much more collaborative and you get much more um, information out of them. So that's um, preparing to succeed. The second one is, is what we might call, um, you know, during the, in the interview itself, a warm setup. So try and build rapport with them, try and have some kind of warm um, introduction, set the context, explain why you're there. You know, if you say we are having this interview because, and then give some valid reason that is to their advantage, so because we want to understand your version of events, um, then people will buy into it. You know, if you say we're having this interview because otherwise you're going to be fired, then that's not going to be very successful. Whereas if you explain to their, it's the, to their advantage, um, then people will, will corroborate a lot more. Um, you may wish to ask if they have any questions about the process. I wouldn't start off an interview saying, have you got any questions? Because that has the potential to kind of divert off into a whole bunch of issues that you don't really want to cover. And you've got your plan and you want to, you want to stick to that. Um, I did an interview a, a couple of months ago with someone where it was almost like a training exercise. You know, sometimes you get these training exercises, and there'll be someone who's quiet and someone who's boisterous. And and um, we went in, and I was with someone in my team who who's pretty junior and had, had not hadn't done many interviews before. And the person walked in, and we agreed to record it. And as soon as I pressed record, um, they just started talking, and they just started talking for about 15 minutes before making all sorts of allegations. And they just started talking, 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 and we just had to let them kind of go and steadily steer themselves back to kind of what we wanted to talk about. Um, but ideally, you want to avoid that situation by, um, you know, don't give them an opportunity to ask a real open question at the beginning. Um, second thing is record their account. So if you're talking about a particular incident, you want to start at the beginning and let them talk all the way through. And you don't want to, ideally you don't want to interrupt them. You just want to say, okay, well from this moment or even from when you got up this morning, you know, what, tell me, tell me what happened. And they will talk, you know, chronologically. And it's important that you use sort of open questions, you know, tell me what happened, um, rather than, you know, did this particular incident happen? Um, and then you've got their account, um, and then when you've got their account, you can get into what we call challenge, clarify, and close. Close. So challenge, as in, you will have in your selection of documents the um, the issues that you want to cover. They may have given a conflicting account during their narrative, and at that point, you can then start producing the documents to challenge certain issues that they've said. In my view, you don't want to, um, you don't want to start challenging them during the account. You want to get their account as a whole and then start, and then start challenging. Um, you may want to clarify key, uh, key facts. You know, if you think they've said something, you did, and you're not, it may have been a bit ambiguous, make sure that you've actually got on record, the, you know, with precision, their answer. Um, the interesting thing with this is that if somebody's if somebody's lying to you, and you've asked them for their account, one technique that you could do 
um, if you're not sure, is ask them to give them their account, but take them backwards through the account. Because actually, it's very, if you're lying about something, it's virtually impossible to lie and think in reverse order. Because you've somehow got to think, well, oh, back here. And if they're lying about what's happened, you can't actually think enough steps back for, for, it, to be, for it to be logical. And lastly, you want to close with a really nice open question. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I'm amazed about how effective that is at the end of an interview. You say that question and you just wait. And you wait that long and people will start talking because they're uncomfortable about the silence. Um, <coughs> so you ask them, is there anything else? Do you think we've missed anything? The other important thing, and this is maybe uh, if you're doing internal investigation, not, um, you know, they might have their details, but I would always make sure that the person knows your, has your contact details and phone number and specifically say, if you have anything else that you want to talk about or you want to clarify anything we've discussed, give me a call and we can talk again. Because everyone here has been to a meeting in which two hours later you go, ah, oh, I wish I'd said that. Oh, what I said there wasn't quite right. And if they haven't got an opportunity to, that they think they can go back and clarify that, then you're going to be slightly off, your, your investigation is going to go off the rails a bit. During all of this, <coughs> listen, it's very, very sort of, you know, probably repeated a lot, but, you know, listening to exactly what the person said is really, really uh, important. <laughs> and the final part of this is, is evaluate. Well, you might, you kind of want to do this, ideally, the first evaluation during the interview and at the end of the interview. Have I covered everything that I want to cover? Can you have a quick look through your notes? If it's been a very long interview, maybe there's an opportunity for you to just have a break, at which point you can review your notes and come back to it. That's particularly important if you're doing an interview where you don't think there's going to be another opportunity to talk to the person. Um, you know, and you know, particularly after the interview, do I trust what um, what the person says? So that's my techniques uh, for lie detection hopefully you're you can you can all be the various eyes um, you know we talked about the change of behavior we talked about not answering the question directly we talked about not telling the whole story so we can call it fudge factor and that people will slightly embellish things but they won't necessarily lie outright to you and we talked about watching for those micro expressions um, I've got those handouts of the investigation plan um, just wanted to say thanks a lot for having me along, and if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. When we are internal auditors, we sometimes have personal uh, relationships with the uh, interviewee. Do you think that that complicates the investigation? Because they know us from previous instances. Um, yeah, I think it can complicate it. I guess it depends on the seriousness of what you're looking at and whether it relates to what you've, you've talked about before. I think if, you, if you're trying to get, uh, I, I guess it comes back to, <coughs> are they going to complain about, are they going to feel that natural justice is being served if there's someone they've dealt with before is also talking to them again, particularly if you've had, say, few clashes or issues in the past, they might view it as, uh, well, they just came into this with a bias, and therefore you might want to try and get another member of the team or someone external or someone to look at it. Um, because if say, if, say, you're doing an interview and that might result in termination of the person, you, the last thing you want is them then coming back to you and saying, well, this process wasn't fair because X, Y, and Z, and you may, you may well have done fantastic job, but there's always a perception that maybe you didn't. Do you, uh, do you have any tips for when uh, you want to be really, uh, brings maybe a lawyer with them or somebody else, there's a page for example? Well, uh, we, 
So, so we normally offer to somebody to have a support person with them, and whether that's HR or independent, that, that's kind of their, um, you know, their choice. Um, often helps to, to they they won't contribute, but um, I haven't personally done one where they brought a lawyer along. I think, um, yeah, that would be potentially more difficult. More difficult. I might consider whether we needed our own. Lawyer there, I guess. If you if if you've got if you've got issues that you think that's going to come up, um, have you have you had someone bring a lawyer on? Yeah, I've had it happen um, twice, um, different interviewees, but for the same investigation mm -hmm. um, twelve months ago. Um, they weren't a hindrance at all. Mm. It just took a bit longer at the start that warm up process you talked about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nothing against lawyers, but when <coughs> you come to a room, room it starts with more icy. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time with lawyers, so yeah, that I, can <coughs> I, I think I think you're you're right that that establishing at the beginning what everyone's role is is pretty really important. Um, that you know you're actually there to talk to the the person you're interviewing, not the lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, and, you've, you've covered a number of points about how to do things well. What are some of the pitfalls? In interviews in terms of things that you see go wrong perhaps when you've been called in after the fact oh, to say um, this didn't particularly hit, yeah. the, hit the mark uh, what, what are those pitfalls that we I think, try and avoid um, when you're it's, and I think you, you touched on it where, where you're doing something internally and there's potential for um, conflict or bias so for example we did a job quite recently where there was a um, a, one of these sort of CEO spear phishing frauds where you, know, you get an email appears to be from the CEO, please can you make this payment? And this company made several payments on the back of it. And they usually and they, on like a Friday afternoon yeah, where no one's available. Yeah, and the sort of CF, they pay this, please. Yeah, yeah the, the, um, the CFO was away and so it went to the next person down. Um, but they had someone in that team doing the investigation into what happened well there's a clear clear conflict there that that they're not going to make findings and in fact one of the findings that we ultimately made was about the culture of the finance team and how the cfo had a very hierarchical view on things and one of the issues <coughs> that caused this was that he had spent a long time telling people that he just telling people what to do so the next level down never had to um, exercise much judgment and so when he was away this issue happened and he had to exercise some judgment and we couldn't do it um, and that sort of finding would never have been found if the finance team had done it internally um, I think the other thing and I was sort of having the same point but but if you're not prepared um, if you haven't thought about what responses you might get to your questions um, you know that's where that's where it can go wrong, and often you only get one shot at talking to people. And so, if you haven't got as much information as you can before you talk to them, then they might just chuck some fact out at you, and um, well, what they claim is a fact out at you, and you, you can't deal with it because you don't know whether it's true or not. Whereas if you've done enough detailed review, um, you can cover them off. Yes. Uh, another question, um, just as far as sequencing the interviews, mm. would you start um, with the accuser, the accusee, somebody partial to that? Do you have a... I, you, you that? I try to work up to the most person that you think was the most responsible for it. Um, it's actually interesting that, that in this, this case that I was just talking about, we thought that we structured the, the order in the sort of one person who approved one payment, followed by this person, followed by the person who originally got the emails and authorized everything. And after we'd done the interviews, we actually realized that it would have been more effective if the last two had been switched around because we found information that came to light in the final interview um, that would have been really useful in the second one. 
Um, I, there was no way of knowing that before we went in. Um, yeah, you just want to you, you want to get to the more pointy end. You, because if I'm talking about preparation, like the the information you gather from the first interviews will obviously influence you in the, in the later ones. Times people take us as though we are the internal auditor. People take us as uh, investigators. Mm -hmm. So there's that raises you know the firewall between and there's a problem comes. In. How do you resolve that? You know, because there's a fine line between investigator and internal auditor. Uh, how would I? What if I was an internal auditor? Yeah, or? we are an internal auditor. Mm -hmm. But when you grab a tweet something about it. People take us as an investigator and then they become defensive and they raise a firewall. Mm -hmm. How do you so, you so your, your issue is when you're dealing with a run, you know, an accounts payroll review, yeah, but people are very defensive, but yeah, right there are like certain things we want we want them to tell us about, and then mm -hmm. we find that they we assume that there is something wrong over there, but they take you mm -hmm. as an investigator, I uh, will take you as somebody like. Acting as a policeman over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that goes back to a trying to build rapport with someone, which I know is hard. I was an aud external auditor for a number of years before I did this job, and yeah. um, it's very hard going to companies where they basically hate you, don't need to be there. Um, the the other part is explain. You know, I said in these interviews, explain why you're doing something. Yeah, I think if you can give them a reason. Um, you know, we're doing this because of, you know, and, and, a, and a valid, reasonable approach, they'll often be more receptive. But it is, you know, currently a problem, I guess. So you talk about planning the um, You said you sort of like your time frame was 45 minutes or one hour, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours. It really depends on how much you want to cover. Like mm -hmm. if I was, so for example, I did an interview that ran for three hours <coughs> a month ago. I probably planned for five hours before it because it was really, if, if not, if not more, because I wanted to get, I had all these phone records and text messages and I had, I wanted to know, is that I want to cover off all these issues. And that plan, that interview was actually a second interview from we had an initial one when we first started this job, um, and then we, that was before we had any documentation. But we had to speak to them at the start, um, and then you know, yeah, I just plan for as as much as you as much as you can, so you don't get tripped up. Obviously, it wouldn't take a week, but. You know. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time for one more, maybe. Yeah. What do you do if you think someone is just outright lying and you need the evidence? Um, cop, cop, just... I think you, you have to take them through through their story. And try and like if there's if you think they're outright lying, try and find other either flaws within their story that doesn't, doesn't sort of stack up, or information that you know that conflicts their view, and ultimately you have to go well, you know, you have told me so, so. You know, I did an interview recently. This person told me they had never called this other person. I clarified that with them. I said so. You never. You told me you didn't call them. They're like yeah, and and you know that's correct. And then I produced the phone records that showed they had called him. And then they had to try and explain what the <coughs> conversation was about. And obviously they had some various reasons about what it was about. But I had suspicions about what it was what it was about. Um, and but all I can ultimately do is is, is produce a report factually, a factual findings saying well. They told me this, um, you know. We, they told me he didn't call them, and he did. 
So thank you very much. Sorry? We've learned a lot and lots of practical examples, which is going to be very handy for all of us in the room. So thank you, Alex. Okay, and this is a small appreciation from appreciate the Institute. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. for hosting it and there's some light refreshment and I hope we get to talk a bit more so please hang around and let's have a chat. Thank I have you. my copies of my infamous plan and I want to say one with Yes, of course we want a copy of that too. So put it next to